Um, so I'm going to be talking about some more specifics um, in terms of the, the insecticide work that we've done over the years. Um, when I first moved here um, in 2017 and started working on Paracilla, uh, really started with uh, some collaborations with uh, folks in, in industry uh, to help get me going and get me familiar with the system. And a lot of it was just answering some of the basic questions of what, you know, what insecticides work. Uh, whether it's a, a true insecticide that is meant to kill Scylla or particle films, um, some of the different ones that we've looked at over the years, but it's not just surround. We have the sea light, Microna, all these other things as well that people are testing out. Uh, so we did a lot of, of just general efficacy testing. And I'm going to just share with you some of the takeaways because a lot of the experiments, they didn't, uh, uh, you know, they, they either didn't show a lot or, you know, you get one result in one year and another result in another. So I'm kind of going to highlight the things that I thought were the most notable um, and put them into the context of, uh, of IPM in this program that we're trying to promote. So um, that's going to be my section of the talk, the insecticide efficacy. And then Rob Curtis will step up here and talk about um, some of the non-target effects work. So uh, testing a lot of the pesticides that we use in pear orchards against natural enemies and seeing which ones are uh, more harmful than others so that you know the risk uh, when you're using certain things um, or potentially, you know, which ones are going to be safe. So just starting really generally here, how do we choose our products um, for Paracilla pest management? Of course, where we want to start is, you know, does this do anything? You don't want to spray a product that doesn't work, right? Um, that seems obvious, but there are actually some products out there that we are spraying for Paracilla that do not work. Um, and then the next question would be, will it harm natural enemies? The most effective tool we have against managing Paracilla, as Robert highlighted, and has been really highlighted over the decades, is having natural enemies in our orchards. They do a better job than we can do. Um, and then this, uh, specifically, we have natural enemies like Trechnites. Their only purpose in this world is to attack Paracilla. So they're good at it. Um, we just have to not kill them. Uh, so, you know, if, if we can conserve those guys, that's our best bet. Natural enemies don't care if you have a big tree that you can't get coverage over. They can move throughout the, the canopy. So if you have those guys, they are always gonna work for you. Um, and then the last thing uh, moving into uh, uh, what we've been talking about with this phenology model is, is it the right time to spray? So it's not just about using a product that, you know, we know kills Paracilla, um, especially now as we're talking more about some of these more selective products that we have. Timing is really important because some things only work if you hit the adults or the eggs. Um, other things only work on the nymphs. Um, and so uh, trying to figure out exactly when to spray. And luckily we have this phenology model that Vince Jones developed uh, to help us help guide us through that. So um, two things I'm just pointing out here off the bat is that with our spray timings aspect of this, uh, with our soft materials that we're planning ahead of time uh, with this phenology model, generally we're targeting adults and also eggs, but the adults and the eggs actually pretty much line up with the phenology model. And what that allows us to do is we avoid the nymphs, which are much harder to kill basically, but also that's what our predators are generally honing in on. Trek 90s especially, only goes after nymphs. Um, Dariocarus and these predatory bugs and earwigs, it's hard for them to eat an adult. So they're coming in at the nymph stage. That's when we're uh, going to have a lot of risk of killing off beneficials for spraying then. So we're going to time our sprays really with the adults. And I'll actually show some data to show that it actually works better that way anyway. And then so for the other part of this is that for our nymph time frames, if we get to the point where we have nymphs out there, it's pretty hard to get enough good strong coverage to to kill these uh to kill the paracilla and we're also putting natural enemies at risk we have other tools for those times we have tree washing uh, which you can do with overhead sprinklers or uh, with air blast sprayers uh, and then also pruning during the summer so you can actually selectively remove shoots that are heavily infested with paracilla and that will also increase your spray coverage uh, which helps with um uh if we're using selective materials the better the spray coverage, uh, the better off you're going to be. All right. 
So, uh, you know, you, you heard a lot about this from Robert, but I'll just put in the plug, like I am going to talk a lot right now, but you know, really you can get all of this information online. Uh, we have our parasitic phenology model, which you really hope people are going to start using and following. It's a one-stop shop to le learn where parasitic are at in terms of their generations and also where you can get your specific recommendations for parasitic in real time. So we're still putting up our uh, degree days for Paracilla. And from those degree days, you can go and figure out what the recommended um, uh, sprays are or management strategies are for that timing. And we really want people to, to do this and to use this tool because you guys paid for it. Uh, this was paid through uh, grants through the uh, Fresh and Process Pair Committee, which if you're a pair grower, you pay into that, but also through the WSDA, uh, uh, especially crop block grant, which, um, uh, you know, at some point comes out of your taxes. So you paid for it. We want to see you using it. And, and we've shown data as Robert did that it is effective. So when you go to this web, this is our website here. It's at treefruit.wsu.edu. And I have it highlighted. Just go down to the Paracilla Phenology Model. Or as Robert said, you can just type in WSU Paracilla Phenology Model. And it's like the first thing that comes up on Google. So it's very easy to find. There's also a new fact sheet that, that Tiana just published that has more information on the biology of Paracilla and also a lot of these management strategies uh, uh, written out if uh, uh, you know, that helps you to see it in a different light uh, and get a better uh, biological understanding of, of, of Paracilla and, and the management issues. So we encourage you to use that also in the same website. All right, so let's get into the, to the nitty gritty. When we talk about insecticides, um, I'm gonna separate this up into two different uh, parts of the season. We have pre-bloom and post-bloom. So in pre-bloom, we're looking at suppressing these adults. So here we have a beet tray where this is what we see early in the season, right? You, you don't need a beet tray to figure this out. You can walk through your orchard with a white t-shirt on and you're just covered head to toe in Scylla adults. And that's what we're trying to suppress to keep those populations low because they're gonna eventually lay eggs, um, which are gonna develop into nymphs, create that honeydew that we don't like. So starting out, we have a couple different options. So we have repellents, organic products, selective conventional products, which means they don't disrupt natural enemies, and then our broad spectrum insecticides. So we've tested all of these things over the years and I'll kind of break down um, what we think is useful. Everything you see up here is, uh, uh, in some way effective against Paracilla, other than my last line down there, which is warrior or lambda psi, uh, that is not effective against Paracilla. And, and we still can see, see it used a lot for Paracilla. Our most important product that uh, we keep talking about is surround. Uh, this has been shown to be the most effective tactic for controlling, especially this early generation of Paracilla. Um, so we're really going to highlight it. But I'll take a second to talk about Warrior. So I thought this was interesting. I knew these data existed, and this was some work that Betsy and I did when I first started. It was one of the first projects I got put on. Uh, there was this idea that there was resistance developing to quite a few insecticides, including Warrior. And in order to test this, we were doing these probit assays. So you basically try to kill a bunch of adults with different concentrations and figure out if the concentration it takes to kill them is different than it was back in the day when the product uh, supposedly worked. So the way we do this is we have a slide dip assay. You stick paracilla adults to a microscope slide with double-sided tape and you dunk them in the, the concentration. You can't get better coverage than that. So <laughs> they, go, they go for a swim and you know what? You wouldn't think anything would come out of that alive. Well, the first couple of times we tried this, the assay actually failed. We couldn't, you, we could not kill them enough to get a reading for the math to essentially work out to figure out what concentration killed them. So we had to just keep exposing them to higher amounts. And this was the end result. Once we finally were able to get a, a final reading, we had to expose them to 80 times the field rate before we started to get 50% mortality. This product really does not work on Paracilla. Um, from talking to folks that have been around a lot longer than me, apparently it didn't work that well to begin with. It was used for other pests, and the hope was that you'd get some mortality on Paracilla as well. Um, you're not getting any on Paracilla. It's not working. 
So I don't recommend using it. It's highly disruptive. It's really cheap, which is nice, but it's just not an effective product for Paracilla. So really, this is something that, that, that you can put to the back of the spray shed in pairs. Okay, moving into things that do work. Surround. Uh, this is our, our top product, and we've uh, uh, shown this through quite a few different demonstrations, which I'll go through. Um, the general uh, uh, how to use this product, uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, and, and I've talked to a lot of people, and I'm not going to tell you that one way is perfect or necessarily better than another. What we are suggesting is to use two sprays before bloom, uh, 50 pounds per acre each for each spray. If you need to go above that because you have really large trees, that's okay. If you spray maybe in increments, say four sprays of 25 pounds per acre, that's fine as well. And sometimes if you have a really long spring, it might work to, that you can actually get three sprays in um, if you're in an area that allows that. But as Robert stated, the earlier you can get in, the better. So that first spray being as early as possible really seems to be associated with success. And then essentially every two weeks after that, if you can cut, recover the tree, that's really going to help. So I like to see this uh, in the spring and go drive through the valley. And when it looks like that, and it's just white as can be, that makes me very proud. So this is some of the work that started this kind of recommendation around Surround and why we think that it's our most important product um, and really why we believe that you can use this without um, broad spectrum materials mixed in with it. What we've seen people do in the past is they really focus on, everyone kind of does the one Surround spray or most people do. And then you supplement that with maybe a couple of Malathions, maybe a Bexar, maybe a Ryman, maybe all of those things together. Um, and hopes that was well, like, okay, the surround's expensive, so we'll mix in some of these other things too, and we'll also kill them. It actually doesn't work as well. And we showed this over two years. We were actually not intending to test this. This was an experiment where we were looking at reflective mulch efficacy, and we wanted to compare it to uh, um, surround as well. Um, so we did a, this trial where we looked at reflective mulch, we looked at two surround sprays pre-bloom, and then we did one surround spray with a bunch of uh, uh, other broad spectrum materials like Bexar in a sale um, in two sprays. Uh, so both, again, here, here we have, this is the conventional program on the, in, in red, we have Malathion plus Surround first, and then a list of broad spectrum materials like Bexar in a sale and, and Novaluron or Ryman together. And the result for both years, we have, really similar outcomes in terms of our surround treatment. Uh, these are the egg numbers that we got. The sur two surrounds alone controlled Scylla just as well as um, using this broad spectrum approach. And even in that second year, it's not significantly different, but we did have a reduced number of uh, Scylla in our surround treatments there. So this was kind of what started it uh, for us believing it's like, hey, we don't think you really need to use these other products. You can actually save money and uh, conserve your natural enemies if you just focus on the surround early season. And then as Robert showed, this is work from this past year where we were looking at uh, these different tr uh, treatments where some of our growers in con commercial plots uh, were doing the phenology-based IPM program uh, versus conventional and organic. And in our phenology and organic programs, generally uh, the growers got two surrounds on, they'd often use a lime sulfur as well in an esteem. Um, whereas in the conventional, it was more focused on uh, at least one surround if, if possible. And then the, the standard mixtures uh, that we can come up with. Uh, and the result was really surprising because we always thought that IPM was kind of gonna fail us early. We just didn't, weren't gonna have the control for this large onslaught of early season adults. And even in these com commercial blocks, that have never been IPM before, uh, we actually had better results uh, in terms of Scylla control. So you can see the red line going way up there. That is the beginning of the season. So we had more Scylla in our conventional blocks that were spraying these, these uh, materials that are supposed to be great at killing Paracilla. So again, focusing on the two surrounds early season really is all you got to do. So I'll talk a little bit about our organic products that we've looked at over the years. And these are just two bioassays that I picked because they were pretty clear. And this is where we're getting some of the 
the foundation for why we recommend uh, these other products as well. If you're looking to get some knockdown on Paracilla, um, here's some uh, data that we have with uh, Cinerate. We have lime sulfur, we have oil. We also have a adult assay on Aza Direct, uh, and then again, Cinerate and Rango, which is uh, uh, an Aza, uh, Aza Direct and product as well. Uh, we're getting high mortality on adults. So these are part of the reason why we prescribe these, project, these products. Um, when you take this to the field, you're not going to see 100% mortality. Uh, you have adults moving in from other places. You're not getting as good a contact. This is a direct spray form bioassay. However, this tells us that these products are toxic to Paracilla. They have low toxicity to natural enemies. So it is something else you can add in uh, to your spray tank if you really do want to see your numbers at least come down some in addition to the surround sprays early. So we also have conventional materials that we consider selective. So that means they're not going to harm natural enemies again. Our main one that we talk a lot about is a steam or pyroproxifen. Um, this is some of the historical work that was done uh, uh, by Brad Higby and Dave Horton and uh, uh, other folks at the USDA on esteem. And what we always talk about is that esteem works by if you target the adults, it'll cause them to lay sterile or infertile eggs. Um, it only does this temporarily. So you get you know one to two days of really good control three to four days of decent control, and then it kind of phases out from there. However, if you think of that over a period of time, that's that many days when you're not uh, getting good egg lay from these adults. So it actually does have a suppressive effect on the population. However, it may take, if you have the opportunity to use, it, use the product twice uh, early in the season, you get even uh, better control using it. Also, it's effective against San Jose scale, so it's kind of nice that we have this other product that, or this other purpose for the product um, for orchards where scale does show up. So we recommend using this right at this phase where the buds start to open up. So bud burst. Um, anytime before that, we don't really think those eggs that are getting laid around the woody tissue are quite as important. Um, however, right when that, that, that bud opens up, that's when the scylla, you know, can easily move into that fresh new green tissue. So we like to sterilize them at that point. And also really surround doesn't do a great job of covering up that green tissue, right? That's why Robert was saying that early surround is very effective. It keeps the insects out of the orchard, keeps the population low, but the ones that are still there or the ones that are just persistent, they're gonna hone in on that, that green tissue. So if you can use a, uh, a steam at that point and you can mix it with a surround to get a, some additional control, that's really going to be your best use of the esteem. So centaur is another interesting material. This is one uh, I'll admit we don't know nearly as much about uh, in terms of Scylla. We've really just started recently testing it. IGRs are notoriously difficult to test against Paracilla because you have to keep the things alive for a long time. They're not going to die right away. They take a while before they do eventually perish because it stops them from going through their full development. However, we've had a lot of interest in it because it's known to be effective against mealybug, which is a problem in pear. Uh, we thought that maybe it will work too against Paracilla. And uh, some work that Chris McCullough did this year uh, kind of gave us our first bit of data that shows that, yes, maybe this does have uh, a bit of an effect. So it looks like here that you know, not quite a 50% reduction in the number of nymphs that were produced uh, when adults were targeted, uh, but close to that, a significant difference. And when you translate that across an entire orchard, that can really result in a significant reduction for a material that essentially you're spraying for mealybugs. So you get the added boost um, on Paracilla. And again, we consider this quite selective. It's not known to have many effects on natural enemies. Okay, so for... The broad spectrum materials, I'm, I'm, I'm a realist. I know that not everyone's going to just clear out their spray shed after this talk. And so we're still going to be using Bexar, Sale, and Mal Malathion, I think. Uh, uh, and, you know, I think eventually we'll get, we'll get away from it. But until then, I think that there may still be a place for some of these things. And if you're going to use them, let's use them in a way that's the most effective. So here's some data that we took. I believe it was in 2018. Uh, we uh, did a spray trial on timings and with a couple of different products in small plots. And uh, the, the main thing that this shows 
it's kind of hard to see because I got all sorts of stuff going on in this slide. But um, is really this early timing, this is delayed dormant, is really the only time that you're going to have much of an effect using it. So malathion in this case really didn't do anything. I have other trials where we did see you know up to about a 40% drop using malathion at this time. But this one, the only one, the only uh, material that had any effect was Bexar at that early timing. The popcorn timing didn't have any effect because, especially not on adults, because they were already dropping off at that time. They were kind of going through their natural dying phase. And then when we go over here and we look at the nymphs from this trial, that early Bexar was the only one that had a significant reduction. And in fact, you look at some of these other ones that we sprayed at popcorn, like a sale, Bexar, and Malathion, again, at popcorn, they, are, they have higher numbers in the control. So really, uh, it's not, they weren't significantly higher, but they were uh, numerically higher. That popcorn spray is a little bit late. So if you are going to use um, any of these broad spectrum materials, I suggest using them early. And it seems that in the current state, the Bexar seems to be just working better than certainly than Malathion. Um, I think a sale gets used a little bit more later, kind of closer to, to bloom than Bexar does. But again, all of these are disruptive to natural enemies. So we also have the thought that if you use them earlier, that you'll be less likely to disrupt the predators as well. So moving into post-bloom, uh, this is where we're going after our summer form adults. Uh, and it's a little harder to get coverage. We have a lot of the same players up here. Surround, we're still prescribing surround this time. It doesn't work nearly as well uh, uh, at this uh, after bloom as we don't get as good a coverage. Um, however, we don't have a lot of products that work great at this timing and that are not disruptive to natural enemies. So it does help if you can get two on again, um, focusing on the adult timings uh, or leading up to the, the adults entering the orchard. Uh, that's that's the best timing. And then we have organic products, which we're really relying on during this time. So summer oil, Cinerate, and Azadirect, which we've shown, uh, have these effects on, uh, on knocking down adults. Um, if you haven't used both the steams yet, you still have one left. You get two per season. Uh, so that's another product that you can use because, again, it'll sterilize your adults for a few days. And then also some folks don't use um, Centaur until petal fall. Uh, so that's an option that may help. Um, Ultor is kind of the, um, the, the last one that I'll talk about. It's a little bit funky. We're targeting the eggs, but it takes a while to get into the plant. So we kind of spray it, um, at the early stages of the adults. Um, and, and that will then affect the eggs, uh, as Robert kind of discussed. And, you know, I can show you the phenology map, but again, it's available online and it says exactly where you would want to target the Ultor sprays for that. So last, uh, again, the, the broad spectrum materials, these are the materials that we have shown to work. I, again, I could put up a lot of slides uh, uh, with, with our different uh, efficacy trials, but it gets really boring. I know you don't want to look at a ton of graphs. Trust me, these are the best ones. If you're going to use a broad spectrum material, that's what I would uh, recommend using. I also would recommend limiting it to one spray. Try to target the adults so that you're not interfering with natural enemies. And, and don't do any more than that if you are convinced that you really need that one broad spectrum material. Um, and again, uh, don't use pyrethroids because they don't work. So I already showed this slide. I didn't show our Ultor slide. This is one of our trials with where we uh, looked at uh, the effects of Ultor. Uh, we compared it to Cinerate and Bexar. We got, you know, statistically it's the same as Bexar. Realistically, probably not as good. Uh, but it does have this effect if you target the, uh, the adult or the egg stage. Um, so it's not a very strong material, but again, we're not necessarily going for strength. We're going for a bit of suppression through multiple different sources, and then we let our predators do the rest of the work for us. So this is our full season program and what it can look like. Our dotted lines here I have up there as optional. So like last year, we had a lot of parasilla pressure. You're probably going to use those optional sprays in that time frame. Um, the other ones are mandatory, and these are all of our soft products. So black lines are surround. Uh, the green lines are uh, any soft material that you choose or multiple. Um, I have Altacore in there for you. This is all, again, on the, on the website. And then we also have uh, times to do our cultural methods. So our, when, when to add mating disruption, 
when to prune, when to wash. You'll notice that all of our spray timings are in these blue curves at the beginning of them because they're targeting the adults. That's when the adult populations are rising and we're trying to keep those adult populations low. Um, and then our pruning and washing times are targeted with the nymphs. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rob Curtis. Um, John, do you want to do questions for me now or do you wanna wait until afterwards? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so <clears throat> sorry, my voice is a little off still from being sick. Um, I know you've heard a lot about natural enemies and why they're important and how they're impacted by, by these insecticides. So I'm going to show you some of the evidence for why um, they are susceptible and specifically what they're susceptible to, but just with the caveat that I'm not recommending any specific chemicals as being 100% safe for, for natural enemies um, because there's variability. Um, <clears throat> as has been covered today by um, Robert and somewhat Tiana, um, there are a lot of different natural enemies in these orchards and they help contribute to resiliency in the pear production system by helping to mitigate insecticide resistance and essentially provide free control services. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, they are invariably susceptible to the insecticides that are used in management programs. And um, what we find is there are fewer natural enemies in conventional systems and more in organic and, organic and, and IPM managed orchards. And in the conventional orchards where insecticides are sprayed in a very intensive manner, that's where we're gonna find insecticide resistance and then lose control of par Paracilla very quickly. <clears throat> so um, again, you've seen this figure a lot. Um, conventional orchards tend to have more Paracilla later in the year than um, organic and IPM orchards. So um, Tiana and Chris Strom, who I see back there, um, put out a paper in 2019 talking about the abundance of natural enemies through two seasons. And this is a good starting point for building a program that <clears throat> conserves natural enemies. And this paper shows that um, there's variability in natural enemies through the seasons. And once you know their seasonal abundance, you can start building these programs that avoid spraying insecticides that will negatively impact them. Um, for this current study that I'm going to talk about, we identified the 19 most commonly used insecticides in pear, in pear management, and we tested the susceptibility of two abundant natural enemies, and that's earwig nymphs and adults and lady, lady beetle adults. The natural enemies that we used in, <clears throat> in these trials were field collected from our unsprayed pear orchard at the research station here in Wenatchee. And we, we tested their exposure by three different um, routes that, that essentially mimic exposure in the orchards. And that's a direct spray, a fresh dried residue on leaves, and aged residues that sat in the sun for four, four to six hours. Each assay consisted of five individuals, and that was replicated six times. So for each insecticide that we tested against each natural enemy stage or species, we exposed 30 individuals to the insecticide mode of, or route of, of exposure. The control exposures were made with only water. And <clears throat> the images that are shown on this page are a coccinellid, showing up there? So, um, this is a, a lady beetle adult um, on a pear leaf with a fresh residue. We also have, um, insecticide uh, treated leaves that are aging in the sun. And we have our, our exposure arenas um, being set up in these pictures with cups of leaves. For all the insecticides that we tested, we used the maximum allowable field concentration um, to test natural enemy survival. We used for direct sprays, we used a small droplet spray bottle. Um, and for the residues, we dipped 
just like Louie talked about with his, uh, his slide dip assays, we dipped leaves in the uh, insecticide to have essentially 100% coverage. And those leaves came from our unsprayed trees at the research station. Um, those leaves then were cut up into five pieces, um, either immediately after exposure to the insecticide or four hours later. And the test insects were exposed individually to, those, to one of those five pieces, which equals the replication. They were placed into one ounce solo cups with lids and 24 hours later, they were given um, food and water. And we monitored their survival every day for seven days. So the reason we chose earwigs um, is not only because they're extremely abundant and easy to collect, but because they're also known predators of Paracilla, their, their behavior being nocturnal makes them potentially compatible with a lot of insecticides that have a short residue because if you spray during the day, the residue degrades and then they're not potentially um, killed at night. Um, <clears throat> we found that their tolerance to the insecticides that are being used, these 19 insecticides, was variable both by insecticide and the route of exposure. So this is a lot to look at. This is the, the mortality, I'm sorry, the survival after seven days. And on this <clears throat> and every subsequent figure, the line down the middle here represents the um, compounds that are thought to be less broad spectrum and more natural enemy safe on the left and more toxic on the right. And again, on the y-axis, you see mean survival of the five individuals that were exposed per replication. Or in other words, larger bars indicate more survival. In the top figure, we have the direct spray assays. In the middle are the fresh residue assays. And on the bottom are the aged residue findings. Um, <clears throat> in these figures, um, for earwig nymphs, you can see that there's generally more mortality and lower survival from the compounds that are on the right than the ones that are on the left. And you can also see that the route of exposure is important. Um, for this insecticide, um, you can see that it's fairly toxic as a direct spray, but it's safer when earwig nymphs are exposed to residues. And this um, lends some validity to the idea that if you spray something during the day when they're not active, you might still be able to conserve them because they're active at night. Um, for this figure, uh, you see the same layout. Safer insecticides are on the left. The harsher ones are on the right. The direct sprays are on the top and the age residues are on the bottom. Um, for this figure, we see a similar effect for the adults as we did, did for the nymphs. The insecticides on the left are generally safer, but as a direct may only be safe when adults are exposed to residues. And for the more co uh, toxic compounds on the right, we also see that several of them are safer as residues than as direct sprays. So moving on to the next natural enemy that we tested, that's a coccinellid, um, Harmonia axiridis. Again, this one is very abundant in our unsprayed orchard and <clears throat> is a generalist predator. Um, so like they have some similarities to earwigs They're, they, um, are easy for us to catch and test in large numbers, but they have a slightly different behavior. They're active during the day. They move in and out of the orchards. So that may make them less compatible with timing insecticide sprays that avoid them. Um, there are other important coccinellid species that are commonly found in the orchards, but this one was the most abundant, um, for our, um, studies that we're showing today. We've done other testing, but these are the only ones that we've completed because it takes a long time to collect enough. So the layout of this figure is the same as the previous two. The line down the middle separates the more toxic insecticides on the right from the generally safer ones on the left. And as you can see, that Harmonia were generally very tolerant of the safer insecticides on the left side of this figure, but there was still a little bit of mortality caused by these safer compounds. On the right-hand side of the figure, it's clear that they're very susceptible to direct contact with most of these insecticides, but they appear to be slightly more tolerant of exposure to residues on leaves. 
So um, I'd like to reiterate what um, others said today that conservation of natural enemies is very important. It helps maintain resiliency in the pear system, but simply spraying the safer insecticides won't necessarily be enough to conserve the entire complex of biocontrol agents. And the susceptibility of, of natural enemies is impacted by both the species as well as the route of exposure. So this is just data on two species. And you can see that there are differences between the two. So if you think about the complex of natural enemies that we have, you can imagine that there will be a different susceptibilities among all of the natural enemies. Um, for some of the species, incorporating information about their phenology and behavior with their susceptibility to specific compounds will help aid in their conservation and minimize negative impacts. And it's important, so basically it's important to know that when they're abundant and avoid using the chemicals that induce high mortality. And this should help you take advantage of their essentially free control services. So that's the end of natural enemy stuff. I think that maybe we're ready for questions.